Hello, I'm David Stanley from the Music Man Project. We are a UK charity which provides specialist music education and performance opportunities to children and adults with learning disabilities across the UK and around the world. The guiding principle of the Music Man Project is high expectation. You would not be watching this video unless you believed in the transformative effect of music, but it is worth considering the particular high importance of high expectation for children and adults with learning disabilities. To support my point, this is our story so far. Future of life and the future of music. High expectation means more than simply expecting good results or outperforming targets. It is a statement of value, a prediction of sustained success, and your faith that musicians with disabilities can break through those limitations that others place upon them. High expectation means investment in the best equipment, the best musicians and teachers, the best technicians and the highest production values. It, it means performing at the world's most prestigious concert venues in front of the biggest audiences. High expectation means challenge. It means teaching the same musical skills, discipline and artistry as the mainstream, but from an earlier starting point over a longer time frame and with, of course, a tailor-made approach. It means effort, patience, and dedication. It is vocation rather than occupation. Sadly, 
high expectation does not historically apply to people with disabilities, be it through innocent lack of understanding, unforgivable prejudice, or most likely a complex combination of the two. The once forgotten society has come a long way, and whilst our work might appear insignificant compared to many disability struggles, music has that unique ability to shine a bright light on the darkness and crash and bang its way through the silence. An audience member attended a concert featuring musicians with disabilities. He only went as a favour for a friend and expected to feel nothing but pity for all the performers. After a few moments, he felt like there was a mirror rising in front of his eyes and he quickly realised it was himself he was pitying. From that moment, he changed his view of people with disabilities. Without high expectation, there is no concert. There is no mirror. Now, I stipulate the following four aims for anyone wishing to run my music education programme. They must provide regular, ongoing and accessible music education, leading to inspirational performance opportunities. Because I'm against one-off workshops, which just show what the students can't have on a regular basis. And accessible means adapting your teaching style, language, resources, but maintaining that same goal of entertaining and enlightening the public. I'm against oversimplifying and using age inappropriate music. Secondly, I want people to nurture the innate musicality through their stimulating and fun teaching. I assume everyone is musical and I create musical patterns for my students to anticipate. I fill my songs with emotion and meaning. So my aim is to unlock their expressive potential. Thirdly, I am to teach groups of students to sing, to sign and play real instruments. The Music Man project performs repertoire that I compose and arrange specifically for the students. I prioritise traditional music making with authentic musical instruments, treating the students as musicians in ensemble rehearsals. They learn to play the right music at the right time on the right instruments. And finally, I want to provide a platform for students to shine as respected musical performers. So I campaign for the rights of people with learning disabilities to perform at the world's most prestigious stages. I promote their achievements in the media and I petition policymakers and funders to invest in them. It took me 20 years to fulfil my promise that one day my students would play the world famous Royal Albert Hall and our next dream is a New York concert tour. These aims have enabled Michelle, a selective mute, to sing solo on a charity single which topped the Amazon Broadway chart. They enabled Carl, who has multiple and complex physical and learning disabilities, to break a Guinness World Record alongside his sister, a graduate of the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. They enabled our musicians to perform in London's West End and at the Royal Albert Hall. They even enabled three individuals with Down syndrome to open a primetime national TV advert. Sweet is a magic number. Sweet is a magic number. Two most fundamental elements of my approach are music education as opposed to music therapy. And number two, concert repertoire. In the UK, there is still confusion between special needs music education and music therapy. Some people even tell me that music education for someone with a disability is, by its very nature, music therapy. But if this were true, Paralympians would not be entertaining millions by competing at the Olympics. They would merely be undertaking their physical therapy in public. My point is, perhaps best expressed in these words from a father who founded a wonderful music college for people with disabilities. He said this, when Daniel had a brain aneurysm 13 years ago, 
he had five therapies a day. There was no downtime, no break. Everything was corrective therapy and goal setting. All this does is make people feel like they are broken. Although our students have to overcome tremendous obstacles to achieve things that many of us take for granted, through acceptance and value, we can help them feel comfortable in their own skin and secure in the knowledge that they are fine just the way they are. I'm not a therapist. I'm a music teacher. My teaching focuses on musicality, expression, and that final performance. I treat my students as musicians at all times. They learn to sing, to sign, and to play new music from memory. And they do this and entertain and inspire audience by their thousands. Of course, the Music Man Project has tremendous therapeutic value as a side effect. But my mindset is music education and performance. It is high expectations and musicianship. 20 years of teaching in this industry has shown this to be the key to my students' sense of purpose, their confidence, and their strong mental health. The teaching session always includes the following features. One, group-based learning. Number two, expressive, challenging, and stimulating music, which is repetitive and easy to learn. Number three, accessible instruments. Djembes, glockenspiel, handbells, woodblocks, triangles, tambourines, and ukulele. Number four, that standard repertoire, standard instruments, so that we can all come together to perform the same music. Number five, the preparation of new concert repertoire for public performance. And number six, singing, signing, playing, and some sort of dancing or movement. We perform well-known Music Man songs and learn new and challenging music. Repetition is central to the teaching, along with enjoyment, making friends and encouraging the students to be themselves. I think music is fundamentally an exchange of energy between the students, between them and me, between us and the audience. My aim is for everyone to feel happy and uplifted, but also exhausted by the end of my class because they've worked so hard. This all helps us to prepare for those major, large-scale performances. In my experience, people with disabilities love to perform. They love the sound of applause and they cannot wait to sing and play their hearts out to whoever is listening. Some of my best students started off hating music. They clutched their ear defenders as if their lives depended on it. With patience and perseverance, regular attendance, those same children play drum kit at full volume without ear defenders in front of thousands of strangers. There is little value in music education unless musicians have a platform to perform. My first West End musical was called From the Asylum to the Palladium, and it told the story of mental hospitals where people with disabilities were treated as patients, alongside single mothers, the mentally ill, poorly behaved children. The journey from this dreadful past to the current care in the community and the relative opportunities available today it was all performed by my students and it was a moving and stark reminder of the struggle faced by people with disabilities over many years isolation to opportunity is a universal story of neglected people across the globe like physical access to buildings toilets education and employment barriers to opportunity in the arts should now be broken down as well so that musicians with disabilities can tell their story to the biggest audience possible at the world's most prestigious venues. My charity is musically defined by the concert repertoire which connects the franchise across the world. It is essential that through differentiation our standard repertoire is challenging for some students whilst remaining accessible for all. It is composed and notated in the classical tradition so that it can be published and arranged and performed by other musicians in many years to come. It is arranged and recorded with the assistance of industry professionals wherever possible. It stands up as a musical composition of value in its own right. It is age appropriate for the majority of students and challenges them intellectually 
emotionally and physically. While simplicity in music is easy to learn and can be very effective, the repertoire should not appear like a nursery rhyme. The Music Man Project provides a wide range of resources to help followers of our programme learn our repertoire. On our website, you can find sheet music, backing tracks, lyrics, signs, demonstration videos, and play along slideshows. Our YouTube channel also provides concert footage from our major London productions, along with performances from regional projects across the UK. These songs have become ingrained in my students' subconscious. For many, they are personal soundtracks to their lives. And I can play any introduction from any song written in the past 20 years, and many immediately know the lyrics, the signs and the instrumental parts. The songs stand alone as effective pieces of music, and they are sung by mainstream school children and choirs, and performed by children and adults with special needs around the world. Now, if you would like some further reading, uh, in 2019, I was awarded a Churchill Fellowship from the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. And this enabled me to research music education and performance for people with learning disabilities in New York. I made 11 recommendations to raise awareness, enhance provision and increase impact in that report. Good morning, I am Dr Natalie Bradford and I am a director of the Music Man Project UK. I have recently completed a PhD at the Royal College of Music, looking at how active music participation can support the well-being of adults with learning disabilities, focusing on people with Down syndrome. I, along with my colleagues, witness every day the widely varied well-being benefits that are created for our students through participating in music. Anecdotal evidence is strong for positive well-being outcomes achieved through music-based activities for people with learning disabilities. However, there is a real lack of empirical evidence to support these claims, particularly when including all three aspects of well-being, learning disabilities and music, and there's even less available focusing on adults rather than children or young people. My research is original in both methodological design and its contribution to knowledge, with an overarching research question of what is the effect of active music participation on well-being among adults with Down syndrome? Well-being has become the new buzzword in many research domains, including the workplace, the educational environment, in healthcare settings, within the local community, and more recently within specific target groups, for example, older adults or people with dementia. Wellbeing is arguably one of the most significant factor in a person's life. It, it can have a major influence resulting in either a positive or negative life outcome. Academics are continuing to debate a workable definition of wellbeing. However, according to Ryan and Dacey 2001, well-being can be understood as how a person feels about themselves, how they function personally and socially within their community, and how they evaluate their lives as a whole. It can be helpful to identify a suitable well-being model as a reference guide. This research adopted the PERMA model of Martin Seligman, created in its current form in 2011, which has five main components. These are positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment. Historically speaking, adults with learning disabilities have been underrepresented in academic literature, particularly concerning the complex subjective concept of well-being. The varied life challenges surrounding learning disabilities have made research into this population challenging, resulting in a significant gap in the literature. In order to obtain an up-to-date clarification of research in the field, a review of current literature was undertaken using the keywords of learning disabilities or cognitively impaired, 
with well-being or quality of life and music, singing, arts, dance or drama in the original search. The initial, initial search identified 1,330 studies. After a more detailed analysis of the abstracts, only 12 studies were included in the final review. Music intervention studies represented nine of these 12 studies. This highlights how there is a real gap in the literature within this field, with music being the most frequently seen intervention. Turning towards the three studies of this research project, a pragmatic methodological design was utilised with a multi-methods approach to data collection, allowing the flexibility required for this relatively new field of research. Study one was an ethnic ethnographic case study of the Music Man project. The main aim of this study was to obtain an in-depth understanding of what taking part in regular active music sessions meant for four adults with Down syndrome and their families. The period of study was 12 months and this covered a variety of music related environments, for example, weekly music classes, weekends away performing and a sellout show at the London Palladium. The researchers spent between 14 and 30 hours per week with each of the participants. They were all regular attendees of the Music Man project based in Essex. The researcher was an accepted member of the group, which facilitated interaction with the participants and data collection. Data were collected via three main methods, these being firstly, participant observations, secondly, semi-structured interviews, and finally, audio and visual materials such as photographic evidence. Data Collective was largely qualitative in nature. A holistic approach was adopted to create a highly detailed and descriptive narrative. An interpretative phenomenological analysis was employed to link common findings or themes between the four participants. Four overarching themes were identified as follows. Positive emotions with sub-themes such as pleasure providing or sense of anticipation. Educational development with sub-themes such as learning through music or focus development. Meaning with sub-themes such as significant to life and accomplishment with sub-themes such as sense of achievement or sense of self-confidence. These four overarching themes were seen in all four participants across all methods of data collection. The findings were supported by verbatim quotations from each participant and field notes and photographic evidence were maintained in a field journal. These themes are closely linked with the key concept of well-being and music participation. The results support the idea that actively participating in music can support all components of the PERMA model of well-being for these participants. The mechanisms through how this was achieved were unique for each individual and context specific. However, the overall benefit to well-being was significant for all participants and their families. Study two aimed to investigate the prevalence of music participation as an activity within the MENCAT organisation, with MENCAT being the largest UK charity supporting people with learning disabilities. A specifically designed online survey was distributed to over 400 MENCAT partner groups. This sought to identify whether music participation was used for their adult members. If so, in what capacity and why it was used, and if relevant, why was music not used more frequently? Data were collected electronically via the SurveyMonkey platform with a response rate of just over 50%, which equals around 200 MENCAP partner groups responding. Statistical analysis was carried out using the IBM SPSS statistics programme a binomial logistic regression analysis was applied in order to predict the likelihood of certain factors influencing whether or not a MENCAT partner group might provide music for their adult members. A three-step model was designed to identify any associations between the following predictors. First being group size, secondly the provision of other non-music activities and thirdly 
any of the following six barriers to music provision being one, lack of available funds, two, not enough staff, three, not enough experience amongst staff in teaching music, four, there's already felt to be enough music, five, a lack of interest from members and six, a lack of evidence to support the benefits of music. The results indicated that the first two variables, i.e. group size and provision of non-music activities, were both statistically insignificant. However, when looking at the six barriers, one of these was found to be statistically significant. This was the not enough experience amongst staff in teaching music barrier. Interestingly, this barrier has the potential to be addressed through the training and development of staff in music teaching. This is something that organisations such as the Music Man Project can support through the provision of training, workshops, resources and ongoing mentoring for any interested parties. Finally, we move on to study three which aimed to investigate the impact of a 10-week programme of music making on the well-being of adults with Down syndrome. Unlike the case study participants of study one, these participants had not previously taken part in regular music sessions. 24 participants took part and provided a full set of data. They were recruited through MENCAP, RCM Sparks, Down syndrome support groups and relevant social media pages. They were all aged 18 or above and with a formal diagnosis of Down syndrome. This was a within subjects design measuring change across the 10 week intervention period for study 3A and using pre and post test comparisons within individual sessions for study 3B. In addition, a non-music session was completed six weeks after the intervention period to provide a means of comparison and control. Data were collected 10 weeks before the start of the intervention period to provide a baseline wellbeing score. Data were then collected at weeks one, week six and week 10 and at the control session. Wellbeing was measured using two different scales. The first being the UCL Museum's Wellbeing Measures Toolkit devised by Thompson and Chatterjee in 2014, and secondly, the short version of the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, designed by Tennant and his colleagues in 2007. With the addition of a picture response option, these scales were both suitable for people with learning disabilities. Quantitative statistical procedures were applied to the data. The results for 3A, which focused on the longitudinal aspects of change were analysed using a Friedman test due to the non-normal distribution of data, followed up with a Wilcoxon signed ranks test. Both wellbeing measures show statistically significant improvements to wellbeing levels. For example, the short Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale showed percentage increases in wellbeing scores of 39% and 48% for weeks one to six and 1 to 10 respectively. There were also significant improvements in reducing negative aspects of wellbeing. The UCL negative wellbeing scale showed reductions of 62% and 58% again for weeks 1 to 6 and weeks 1 to 10 respectively. When looking at study 3b, this focused on the changes seen within the individual sessions recorded pre and post test. Week one showed the greatest amount of improvement with a 28% improvement in perceived well-being alongside a 46% reduction in negative, negative aspects seen for these participants. In terms of comparing the long-term effects of study 3A with the short-term effects of study 3B, the longer-term scores reported across the 10-week span revealed a higher percentage change to perceived well-being although all results were statistically significant. Finally, to sum up these three studies, the use of active music participation through the Music Man project had a considerable impact on the well-being of the participants in study one, as described by themselves and their families. 
Study two found that although approximately three quarters of men cat groups use music to some degree, this was typically passively listening to music rather than participating. The largest barrier to not providing more active music participation was a lack of confidence of staff to deliver the sessions. Finally, study three found that a 10 week programme of music making produced significant changes to wellbeing, both in terms of improving positive wellbeing and reducing negative wellbeing. In conclusion, the use of active music participation as a support to wellbeing for adults with Down syndrome is highly beneficial for both those who have been participating regularly for some time and also for those who are new to music as an activity. This research makes an original contribution to knowledge and has provided both qualitative and quantitative evidence to support this claim. Thank you for listening and I look forward to receiving any questions.